<laughs> hey everyone. Um, so thanks for joining us for um, this uh, Stork seminar series where today we're going to be having a debate about the use of null hypothesis significance testing in kinesiology. Um, on the uh, fore side we have Dr. Daniel Larkins who is an associate professor in the Human Technology Interaction Group at Eindhoven University of Technology. And in the uh, against position, we have uh, Dr. Paul Swinton, who is a um, reader in applied statistics at Robert Gordon University. So without further ado, so we have as much time to discuss this topic as possible. We are going to move straight on to the four arguments with uh, Dr. Daniel Larkins. So over to you. All right. Thanks so much. Um, so I'll share a couple of slides and uh, I'll take uh, about 10 minutes, which is probably more than I need to convince everybody that we should use p-values. I have no idea why I've been debating this for the last 60 years. I think nine minutes should be more than enough. So the first thing that I think is um, important to realize is that if we talk about p-values and their use, we always have to talk about some specific philosophy of statistics. This step is typically skipped which makes these discussions really uh, difficult and problematic because then you don't really know what you're actually debating or what your goal is um, when you make statistical inferences. So I wanna focus on this first step. According to people who should use p-values or want to use p-values and think they're doing so correctly, what is the goal of statistical inferences? And I think this has been nicely described in this paper by Frick from 1996. He responds actually to an older argument by Rosenbaum, who says that scientists should not be making decisions about claims, but they should update their personal beliefs. And Frick responds against this. And he says, no, there's a different goal that we have as scientists. And the goal of scientists is to collect a corpus of claims that are considered to be established. So what we do is we get a lot of these sort of facts or things that we at least temporarily believe as facts and we collect a lot of them and we use them, for example, for theorizing or sometimes to make concrete decisions about which studies we'll do and which studies we won't do. So there's a corpus of claims that we have. Now, if we take a look at what researchers do, we often see that indeed they make claims. There's a lot, uh, a lot of people who seem to like to make claims when they publish papers. They might put them in their titles, for example. I collected a couple of examples here. Individual participant data meta-analysis provides no evidence of individual response variation in individuals supplementing with beta-alanine. So that's a claim. That's the title. Sometimes the claim is not in the title, but if you read the article, you'll see it somewhere in the conclusion section. For example, this is another claim from the literature, oral contraceptive pill use might result in slightly inferior exercise performance on average when compared to naturally menstruated women, although any group level effect is most likely to be trivial. So these are claims based on data, based on statistical inferences. Of course, I just want to point out that these all come from the work of my opponent in this discussion. So even my opponent seems to want to make claims. Now, if we make claims, then claims, obviously, can be right or they can be wrong. You can make a claim and be correct about it, or you can make a claim and be incorrect about it. Now, as scientists, we would like to be correct about the claims that we make. So if we use a procedure to determine whether we can make claims or not, we want this methodological procedure to be right most of the times. Now, we could have, as a methodological procedure, a coin flip. So a coin flip, we just flip a coin. We don't even collect any data, and we just decide whether your claim is correct or not based on a coin flip. Now, this procedure would have a 50% accuracy rate. That's not very high, of course. So that's why we don't use a coin flip in science. We use something else. And indeed, what we use are hypothesis testing procedures that have been developed many years ago, maybe 80 years ago, by Neyman and Pearson, for example, that can control the rate at which we make erroneous claims. So we have a methodological, a methodological procedure, and if we use it correctly, and if we design studies correctly, then we have this methodological procedure that allows us to make claims without making too many errors about them. So if we use this procedure, we make the decision in advance that if we observe a p-value that's smaller than some sort of alpha level, we are allowed to make a claim. Now, that's not a claim that we've discovered the truth. We never discovered the truth. That's not something we can do in science. But 
I wrote it out sort of what this claim is. So if you find a significant result and you use this methodological procedure, you're allowed to say something that sort of sounds like we claim there is an effect while acknowledging that if scientists make claims using this methodological procedure, they will be misled at most, whatever your alpha level is, 5% of the time, which we deem acceptable. So this is a rate at which we are happy to make mistakes. Sometimes we should maybe put this a little bit lower, but okay. So let's for the foreseeable future, right? This is still the claim we're making. Let's for the foreseeable future until new data emerges that might prove us wrong assume that our claim is correct. So this is a very long sentence. We often don't really treat it like this, but this is sort of what you get if you use this methodological procedure. So what are the alternatives? If we don't want to use p-values, well, p-values are a methodological procedure that allow us to make claims with a known error rate. So if we don't use it, then either we are left with methods that do not allow us to make claims, or we are using methods that allow us to make claims with unknown error rates that might be much higher than we actually like. And I would say that neither of these things are very attractive. So if we don't use p-values in this methodological approach, then we don't really have a tool to collectively build claims that we agree on. So this corpus of findings that we can all agree on and use for theorizing or designing our next studies, or maybe sometimes even implementing interventions. So, Either we can't make these claims or we would make claims and those are wrong much more often than we want, right? So both of these things without p-values are not very attractive, I think. One attractive thing of using this methodological approach, p-values, to make scientific claims is that we have a method that we can collectively agree upon that claims have been made with a certain level of severity. For example, if we make... Uh, if we design a study that has a very high statistical power, 99.9%, .9%, so we have extremely high power, we have a very small alpha level, 0.1 or something percent, everybody agrees that the risk of an erroneous claim is very low, and we can all accept that we have made a claim that at least for now we can sort of use. We have established this. We can all agree that this is, you know, something we can build on. Now, there are two things I would like to respond against some alternatives that people have mentioned in the past. So one is Bayesian statistics, right? That's an alternative to the use of p-values. That's also what Rosenbaum was talking about. We should use uh, procedures to update our beliefs, but not procedures to make claims. If we use p-values, those are not dependent on individual beliefs. And some people here, there's a quote by Kaper and Lele. Some people say that this is quite attractive, right? They like this. They say that science needs mechanisms for the accumulation of sound conclusions. So that's what we're talking about, establishing this corpus of findings that we can all build on. And then they say, it's not that we believe that Bayes' rule or Bayesian mathematics is flawed, but from an axiomatic foundational definition of probability, Bayesianism is doomed to answer questions irrelevant to science because they don't want to have belief mixed in in the claims we make. We do not care what you believe. We barely care what we believe. We are interested in is what you can show. All right, so this is Bayesian statistics, which is not a good solid basis to have a procedure to make claims that we all agree on. Now, another recent popular approach is estimation approaches, which we call the new statistics. But estimation is not really a way to make a claim. You just make a description of how large an effect size is, but you're not making claims that others can contest. You could say, well, why do we need to make claims in science? Well, for some reason, we kind of like this. Look at this debate. I mean, now we're debating things. I'm making claims, and uh, Paul is going to make the opposite claim in a bit. And that's sort of how science yeah, likes to work. Um, people make certain claims and then challenge them. And in this sort of process, we hope that the most uh, useful claims survive. It could be that we can have a science where we don't need this sort of you know, slight fighting and claim making and testing against each other and challenging claims. Maybe we can organize it in a much more smooth way. But this would require widespread consensus about things we want to estimate with a certain accuracy uh, and probably a lot of scientific collaboration, which we don't have. So I'm sympathetic to this viewpoint, but I'm not completely sure we can implement it at this moment. Now, 
luckily, when we talk about different approaches, it doesn't really matter what we do in practice, I think. So for example, in this graph, you see that p-values and base vectors are directly related given a certain prior. Another recent proposal is second generation p-values, which sort of based on a confidence interval interpretation. And you see here that there's a, a solid line and a dotted line. Ba basically, the second generation p-values are almost the same as equivalence tests, which are just statistical tests based on p-values. So all the procedures that exist are more or less pointing in the right direction, but I like to have a logical, consistent approach when we do certain statistical inferences. And p-values are just a very nice way to make claims about the direction of effects or sometimes about the range in which an effect is um, based on a methodological procedure that gives us a known maximum error rate. And thereby, they allow us to um, use them to form the basis of collectively agreed upon corpus of finding, findings um, that we can then corroborate in future studies or try to refute in future studies. So that is my argument for why we should all be using p-values. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you for opening that up, Daniel. And uh, we'll move over to you, Paul. Oh, you're muted, Paul. That there we go. my screen, yeah, perfect. Okay, excellent. Okay, so, um, Yep. Thank you for that presentation, Daniel. I'm um, really looking forward uh, to this uh, discussing this topic. And um, thank you for picking some more of my recent research as well. Uh, <laughs> you didn't go too far back, so thank you very much for that. Um, so in this short presentation, um, I'll introduce a framework that I've found useful uh, in thinking about how p-values are used uh, when dealing with data, so progressing from um, significance testing, hypothesis uh, testing, uh, and null hypothesis uh, significance testing as well. Um, and so as Daniel mentioned, I'll talk about inferences as well, but I'll, I'll go through um, a, a sort of framework I like with sort of different levels of inference and outline basically why p-values and hypothesis testing, et cetera, are, are limited at each of these stages. So that's the plan anyway. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry. Um, so put simply, um, a p-value describes the compatibility of data with a null hypothesis. So in kinesiology, that generally represents no effect, no relationship, uh, or no difference. Uh, but to be more nuanced, uh, p-value is actually quite a strange transformation, as it describes um, the compatibility of not just data that we observe, but also with more extreme data. So that's one nuance that's um, important. The second is that the p-value depends not just on the null hypothesis, but it also depends upon uh, a number of other um, important assumptions. So those are regarding the statistical model and analysis practice as well. And I'll focus on um, throughout the presentation why these two nuances are quite important in understanding the limitations of, of p-values. So the most basic use of p-values occurs in statistical testing. So here the focus is on the specific study and the p-value is used in a continuous manner. So there's no bright line uh, in terms of uh, evidence against the null. And there's also a limited attempt to generalize beyond the specific sample. Um, the next use of p-values comes in hypothesis testing. So here the focus is kind of not on the specific study itself, but it's viewed more in sort of um, all the potential studies that could be uh, conducted. Um, and so really, as Daniel mentioned, that's where we're trying to sort of determine broad conclusions and recommendations. The final use of p-values is kind of what I like to think of as null hypothesis significance testing or NEHT for short. And that's where the two sort of opposed um, protocols are brought together. And the researcher tries both to make 
um, broad conclusions and recommendations, but also tries to attach that significance value specifically to the study as well. So they're trying to achieve both things with, with the p-value. And um, that tends to be where most individuals feel that uh, there's uh, extreme limitations. So the inference uh, approach that I quite like to adopt to kind of uh, you know, map to these different uses um, is Richard Royal's uh, sort of three levels of inference. So starting off, p-values provides a, a nice interpretation of uh, what do these data say. Um, moving on to the next inference level, you've got what should I believe after seeing these data? And that kind of maps to significance testing. And then finally, as Daniel mentioned, we've kind of got what should I do? In other words, in kinesiology, what should I uh, conclude? What should I recommend? And again, uh, that maps more to um, hypothesis testing in um, NHST. So going through each of these inferences and mappings, uh, what I'll try to do is uh, introduce some of the limitations of p-values. So I'll actually start with um, what these p-values don't say. And so we can see there's typically common misunderstandings used in the literature, and these typically revolve around sort of probability statements that are used with the p-values. So in other words, the probability of a real difference is, or the probability that results were caused by chance is this. And obviously the problem with these interpretations is that the p-value is calculated under the assumption that the null hypothesis was true. So therefore the value can't be inverted and used as a probability because it was originally set at 100%. So uh, that's one of the uh, sort of major limitations there. Instead, effectively, all that can be said is that p-values provide some sort of difficult, hard to understand relative index of evidence against the null hypothesis and its associated assumptions. So in other words, smaller values, all they do is describe greater incompatibility. So in essence, uh, p-values, they provide minimal information. They're actually hard to interpret. Uh, and they're often um, attack a hypothesis that's of no real interest. So in kinesiology, often uh, researchers are interested in quantifying the effect of something that we believe to exist and might actually be quite large based on the experiences of, for example, athletes and practitioners. And so therefore the null hypothesis is um, irrelevant. So moving on to the next level of inference, so that's basically what should I believe um, after seeing these data. This can be mapped um, quite well to significance testing. So significance testing, again, uh, p-values are interpreted continuously, but they're benchmarked. So for example, uh, a common benchmark would be p equals 0 0.05. And basically values around here are treated as a signal that something is potentially of interest and uh, should be considered further in the context of theory, previous results, or you know, as an exploratory research, it should be investigated further. Um, there's no bright line. So in other words, uh, with significance testing, there's no difference between P equals 0 0.04 and 0 0.06. Uh, in addition, as I said earlier, with significance testing, the focus is actually on the specific study and the sample obtained. So there's an understanding that p-values can change markedly from study to study based on sampling error. So uh, we, with significance testing, broad interest and more confidence only builds when we're able to replicate experiments or, you know, experiments in different samples consistently generate low p-values. So whilst this perspective does seem a lot more reasonable, it also has limitations. Um, one of the major limitations being that, uh, you know, a moderately significant value, so that's a p around about z of 0 0.05, it actually provides limited evidence against the null. So as uh, Daniel described, we can um, transform p-values to probably more informative statistics, one being uh, the Bayes factor. And if you, you know, start with an equal prior on both assumptions, um, you can see that basically a p-value of 0 0.05 still represents about um, at least a 29% chance that the null is true. And so obviously that's very different with most people's conceptions. When they see a, a 0 0.05, they're thinking there's only a 5% chance the null is true. And that um, mistaken interpretation is because the p-value is a tail area probability. So again, it's considering not just the data observed, but more extreme data. So uh, you know that's a, a, a limitation in using significance uh, testing and benchmarks um, that actually don't provide strong evidence against the null. 
So in summary, with regards to inferences and what data show and what should you believe, um, p-values, um, you know, they're limited uh, because of, of their quirks. Uh, arguably in kinesiology, I think as Daniel said, um, maybe the use of effect size and appropriate measures of uncertainty might be more informative. And finally, there are other methods that are potentially more suited, at least to dealing with uh, inferences such as what should I believe in. As I said, that um, um, falls under the purview of um, Bayesian methods. So moving on to the final level uh, of inference, here is actually where, as Daniel uh, uh, mentioned, I agree with him, it's where p-values are much cleaner and easier to interpret. So, um, and they do work well in theory, however, they don't work well in practice and, that, and, that's, a, and that's a problem. Um, so in hypothesis testing, um, researchers go through the process of estimating an effect size, um, setting an alpha to control the error rate, thinking of sample size, et cetera, so they can control both false positives and false negatives. That's the theory behind the process. Um, importantly, with hypothesis testing, we really don't care about the magnitude of the p-value. It's just, is it above or below a threshold? And obviously, immediately that like um, gets us into the problem where what happens if we find a p-value of 0 0.05 and 0 0.49? We're forced to basically have a different conclusion, which, uh, you know, from a face validity per set, doesn't make much sense. Most importantly, and, and probably as I'll come back to when we move on to this sort of questioning perspective, um, the real problem with hypothesis testing is it's an attempt to try and leverage certainty and insight from data alone. And that tends to be very problematic, uh, especially in disciplines like kinesiology. So, um, what I'd like to do just to end this presentation is just focus a little bit on uh, one of the other major limitations, because I think this will probably map more to what Daniel's speaking about um, with p-values and the sort of the second nuance that I'd like to discuss. And so the second nuance is that we can generate low p-values, not just when the null hypothesis is incorrect, but also the model assumptions are incorrect. And the model assumptions also include uh, the conduct of the analysis. So for example, um, a p-value assumes that only one test was conducted, the, con the test was conducted after the hypothesis was set, and that uh, you know, to gain an overall understanding of error rates, all analyses will be disseminated. Uh, unfortunately, due to a number of issues and the association of significant results with positive and interesting findings, it appears that researchers routinely engage in biased and sometimes questionable practices, such as p-hacking, harking, to generate significant findings, and these will greatly increase the number of false positives that exist in the literature. Uh, this is of a particular problem in kinesiology, where analyses are often conducted on very small sample sizes, and we have the potential to collect data on hundreds of variables. So we can select means, we can select peaks, we can select them at different time points and movements, we can select from a whole variety of normalization procedures, and this presents lots and lots of opportunities for individuals to select extreme values, even though they typically uh, suggest physiologically implausible results. Um, I think another interesting problem uh, for kinesiology is even if we don't engage in biased practices such as p-hacking and harking, there's mutual multiplicity issues uh, to consider. So that's basically um, where multiple tests could be conducted. So things like uh, through transformations, through model building, through outlier detection. Uh, the fact that data is idiosyncratic, especially with small sample sizes, means that even if a researcher only um, conducts one test, the fact that multiple tests could be conducted has the same effect as all other multiplicity and actually increases uh, the type one error rate. So even if you're not engaging in bias processes, uh, error rates are still likely to be uh, inflated. So final slide. Um, so finally, I just want to move on to uh, the last um, sort of mechanism that's used with p-values and that's null hypothesis um, significance testing. And as I said, that's basically where people try to get the best of both worlds with two philosophies that are quite opposed to each other. So using both um, the p-value to look at um, the long run perspectives in terms of people's, uh, in terms of um, what should people do, recommendations, et cetera, but also attaching um, significance and certainty to individual studies. And you can see the problem uh, that this creates typically in the discussion section of kinesiology papers. 
Um, so kinesiology studies are generally conducted on small convenient samples. And so results are expected to be uh, idiosyncratic. And so even if you know, a study is repeated, um, it's likely that some tests will, you know, some studies will have a significant finding and some won't. The reason for that is most likely sampling error and um, different uh, analysis practices. However, in the field, we're not allowed to say that. So instead, what we make up is various ad hoc arguments. You know, we suggest that the results are due to, you know, one data being collected on a Tuesday and the other on a Wednesday, males versus females, different protocols and so on. So these are all very much ad hoc arguments when if we're being honest, the most likely reason is simply sampling error and different practices. So that sort of reinforces my final point, which is basically um, NHST, uh, it's an inappropriate method to generate, that's used um, falsely to generate insight and certainty where that doesn't exist in most research. Uh, it's probably best viewed as being highly stochastic. So I'll finish there, Thank, thanks James. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Paul. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to allow five minutes for each um, each person to respond to the arguments from the opposition. So we'll start off with Daniel. Um, so you've got five minutes now to kind of provide your response, and then we'll switch over to Paul. And then after that, we'll open up to a more kind of back and forth discussion. Um, We'll see how the kind of discussion goes between Paul and Daniel. Um, but if you've got questions, I see some people have been putting them in the chat already. Um, pop some questions in there. If the uh, conversation dries up a bit, we'll uh, we'll probe some questions from there. I've got some uh, some questions teed up just in case, uh, so we can fill the time. But I'm sure there'll be plenty to uh, continue discussing. So um, over to you then, Daniel. All right. Thanks. So. Um... One of the things I think is useful to keep in mind about um, the problems with p-values is, is their use um, and their, their correct use and their in-practice use. So I agree that they're often misinterpreted and misused. Um, I have some um, priors about the probability that if we switch to anything else, people will also misuse and misunderstand those statistics. Um, there is some evidence that this is the case for confidence intervals, for example, uh, where people think that they tell you the most likely values or base factors, which people don't interpret as relative evidence, for example. So um, it's just that they're not used enough or maybe not analyzed. Their use is not analyzed enough to have a long literature of misinterpretations, but I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. Um, and I would love to see empirical research figuring out which of these is actually most likely to misinterpretations, because the procedure of a p-value when correctly applied and when people pre-register is actually relatively straightforward. So I don't know, I have some hopes uh, there. Um, another point you mentioned is about the interest in effect sizes. And I think this is very important. And um, the current use of um, hypothesis test is a bit limited, but we can improve it a lot uh, and this is actually was always the proposal, right? If you read papers from the 30s, people never really uh, suggested that the null hypothesis always has to be an effect of zero. So in the case of applied research, where you're interested in an effect size and you already have strong expectations that there is some effect, there's very often also standard practice. And what you want is actually to improve upon the current standard. So not just show that something improves um, training or performance, but you want to show that it improves it more than something else. In that essence, you're actually comparing the current standard to uh, a better version of it. And there, the null hypothesis has become very meaningful. If there's no current standard, we sometimes can specify a smallest effect size of interest. So we, you don't have to test against an effect of zero. And actually, in uh, your paper where you say that there was a trivial effect of uh, something, we can specify what a trivial difference in performance is, and we can test against that and conclusively make a claim without being wrong too often that there is indeed an effect that is too small to matter for all practical purposes. This is a small improvement on the current way we do it, or I, I think um, theoretically a small step, practically a small step, but, but of big consequences. It would really improve the way that we work quite a lot. Um, so those are two main things I think about effect sizes. Um, the 
the limitations of the procedure about what we should believe, um, I think those are valid. But again, it's very important to keep in mind what the goal of um, hypothesis testing and p-values are, at least according to a name and Pearson perspective. They actually introduce their approach by saying, without ever knowing whether we're right or wrong, so without knowing what we should believe, we can have a procedure that will lead us to conclusions that are not misleading most of the time. And in a science where everybody has their own beliefs and will probably not have our beliefs at the same you know, level and we won't agree on those, one of the strengths of having a procedure which we all have to agree in because our beliefs don't matter is actually a very important role. So I think we shouldn't step over that important function of a methodological procedure that allows us to make claims that we all agree on because our prior beliefs don't matter. Um, and having those claims really is an, an important goal, I think, that's slightly undervalued in your presentation. So yeah, those are three things I'd like to respond to first. Brilliant, thanks for that, Daniel. And um, back over to you then, Paul. Yeah, I think myself and Daniel said it would be interesting to get to the question stage. Um, so I'll, I'll just, I think I'll reply um, to the last one. I, I, I think Daniel's mentioned this point a, a few times and it's um, something along the lines of, um, it's not beliefs that matter, it's claims we all agree on. And I would dispute that heavily, especially in kinesiology. I cannot think of a single topic in which we all agree on anything. So I, I think therein lies the problem is that um, if p-values and, and null hypothesis significant testing worked, um, if we were interested in um, effect sizes of reasonable magnitude, so we had sufficient power, et cetera, to conduct these analyses, then yeah, I agree, we potentially could get to consensus. Uh, the fact that I genuinely cannot think, think of a single issue in our field that there is consensus suggests that um, this is not the case. And so therefore I think then there's nothing wrong with, um, for example, Bayesian analyses, um, having individual beliefs, um, setting skeptical priors, setting um, priors that map to what practitioners believe, etc. Because ultimately, that's where we are as a discipline. Uh, we each put together from our paper an argument uh, that we hope that is, you know, reflects the author's true opinions based on the data, based on previous information, based on um, physiological mechanisms. The only difference is. Bayesian analyses, what that does is it forces you to be a bit more transparent and quantitative with what your priors are. So it's just a formal process of doing that. So I agree with Daniel as well. If we move to Bayesian methods, yes, there will be misinterpretations, there will be um, abuses, for lack of a better word, with the processes. The difference probably is that these methods don't seek to create certainty especially, for example, a Bayesian approach, it, it, you know, it finishes with uncertainty. It finishes where here's my posterior distribution, here's what I believe probabilistically. The problem for me with null hypothesis specific testing is that it tries to create certainty. It basically says, okay, the researcher, you can have your biases, et cetera, set up the study, but from then on, hands off, the data will decide what to believe. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it creates a, a definitely a false sense of security and certainty in the field. Brilliant. OK, thanks for that. So actually, what I'm going to do then is, um, as you both seem keen to get on to the questions, how would you guys like to do it? Would you like to... Um, kick it off yourselves and engage in a bit of to and fro or do you want to um, do you want us to pick some of the questions from the from the chat or or me pose a few and and let you guys have at them all good yeah no oh. preferences <laughs> thanks that makes my job easier right um so i have to desert side um okay so one thing that i'm going to start off with with ben is because i think for some of the people in the um in the audience there might not be a um a real nuanced appreciation of the difference between 
statements that claims that are being made here around use of p-values and claims that are being made around use of null hypothesis significance testing from a name and Pearson perspective. So could we start off by kind of clearly differentiating what, what exactly is it we're talking about here for the purposes of, uh, of this debate? Are we talking about pros and cons of using p-values or pros and cons of using name and Pearson hypothesis testing? Mm. Well, I think the only sensible use of p-values is name and Pearson hypothesis testing. So when I uh, see Paul talk about using p-values as sort of strength of evidence or those kind of things, I would actually, if you want that, I would say use a base factor or use a likelihood. Uh, I think they're sort of bad proxies um, for those things like evidence. So in that sense, um, I'm actually in favor of uh, Paul's viewpoints. If that is what you want, if that's your goal, to quantify evidence, for example, for or against something, then you probably don't want to use those p-values. Um, of course, if I have want to defend them, which I want, then I think the only real strong point they have is their use as these decision procedures, which is this name and Pearson perspective. So this is really, you just let, indeed, as Paul says, you let the data guide you. So you, you set up a study, there is an, a roll of the dice, basically, and there's a, a p-value below your critical alpha level or above. And if it's below, you can't, uh, if it's below, then you're allowed to make a claim that your whatever you predicted is, is uh, the thing we should go with now until the future proves us wrong, right? So I think it doesn't give you certainty, hopefully, but that is what we go on. And it is actually a, a real strength that this very simple process helps us to move forward and make decisions about what to do next uh, as we do studies. Today, there was this very large re pre-registered replication of ego depletion effects. These people had to show that their theory did what it was supposed to do. They failed to observe a statistically significant p-value, even though they had a huge amount of participants. This is this back and forth. We, we can now all say, okay, so there seems to be nothing there. That's not the end of it. Someone else might show that there's actually something there. But at the moment, we can all just act like, okay, let's call it a day for, for now until the future proves us, prove this, this finding wrong. And that's a very nice way of moving forward. Um, people are still allowed to have their personal beliefs and disagree and try again. So the, the decision to go and try uh, study ego depletion again, by all means, that is based on your personal beliefs. But as a field, we can say, look, this is over. No more special issue on ego depletion for the next future until somebody else fi fixes this, this and figures this out. Um, yeah, James, I think that's a really good question. As I said, I like the terminology um, hypothesis um, and, uh, testing and, and NHST. I, at least I, I equate that with trying to do both. And so I think that's typically what we do in kinesiology. So we're trying to get the best of both worlds. We're using uh, the name and Pearson approach, but we're also using it as strength of evidence for that specific study as well. Um, and you know, hence, you know, in kinesiology, why we actually produce p-values, you know, and you, you're basically, you're not allowed to just say p less than 0 0.05. Effectively, you're trying to get the both uh, best of both worlds. So I agree with, with, with Daniel that, um, yeah, just do hypothesis testing. That makes sense to me. Um, the problem is, I think Daniel said, it, it's a real strength. And it is, in, a, in theory, almost never in practice. And I think you have to look at um, discipline specific, uh, specifics and also areas within a discipline. So in kinesiology, um, it is a brilliant area, but you know we are in the position often where, especially if you're interested in performance, uh, we're in an environment where funding is basically nil. And so it is very, very hard to conduct research. So when we do engage in research, we will typically have very small sample sizes. And if we get people in the lab guaranteed, well, we're going to uh, maximize that time. So we're going to collect everything under the sun. Um, who's not going to? It's so difficult to collect data anyway. So the question is then in that type of scenario, so in that environment, um, significance testing uh, for me just then doesn't work. Uh, there's too many variables, too many tests, not enough power. And therefore, it's just not a good approach. But I think, as Daniel said, if we, if you're lucky enough to be in an area where you 
do have access to large sample sizes of the population you're actually interested in and not some convenient sample that that's not who you're really interested in then your yeah, hypothesis testing um, is potentially a very valuable approach uh, to research but if you are unfortunately not in that position where that's uh, typically possible then um, i think it results in more harms than good I just want to take this this comment about it being a valuable approach under certain conditions. I'm already taking that one in. Thanks, Paul. Let me return it by saying that you're completely right, that if people start to mindlessly calculate p-values and they actually have very small sample sizes, they missed an essential step in um, the correct setup of a hypothesis test, namely designing your study, making sure that you actually control your error rates. And I think that's what Paul's saying. If you have very small sample size, your error rates are going to be huge all over the place. So it, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a procedure where you know that the error rates of any conclusions are very, very large. Anyway, you can't learn anything in a sense like that. Right? You want to keep the error rates relatively small. That means you have relatively high power, relatively low alpha levels. And if you just have a handful of participants, that's not what you're going to get out of the results, basically. In those situations, so some people ask in a chat, like, so what should we do if you have limited sample sizes? I, I don't know what Paul would recommend, but I think there are just real limitations of what you can learn if your data collection efforts are, are very limited. What you probably need to do is what some other fields like genetics have done. You have to pull all your resources together and focus on the few questions that you really want answered and do those collectively as a field. Without a lot of data, you can't learn a lot. But then when you have grouped together, what you probably want to do is make some claims that you can all build on using these hypothesis testing procedures. Um, if you don't mind, can I just come in on that one? Yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, I think that's that's an excellent point. But kind of, you know, if you think of the uh, the process that would ultimately lead to there, given the sort of degrees of freedom that we're typically interested in, so obviously my interest is predominantly in strength and conditioning. Um, you know, these smaller studies are are good to ultimately shape what the larger study will be. You don't want to you know, blow all your resources, get together multiple centers across the world, and then end up um, doing like, I guess, a, a training program, et cetera, that, that, that's horrific. So the small studies help to build, uh, build ultimately to, to the large studies, but we still want to use the, the, the data collected from the small studies in the most sensible, sensible way, because they, they do contribute a lot. The question is, should we use hypothesis testing or something else? My argument should be in those small studies, uh, we should use something else. Yeah, I, th I think that is very sensible. Again, somebody, uh, Aaron in the chat is asking, in the case of these small exploratory or exploratory research, can you use p-values continuously? So exploration always has the probability that you'll mislead yourself a little bit more than you want to. But if you are just exploring things, um, that is not your main concern. You just want to take the data that you have and, and see where it guides you, sort of, you know. That, that is a risky process. It's going to be um, very likely uh, much noisier in the, in the sense that you make more mistakes. In those senses, you're really very carefully trying to update what you know about the situation. And likelihoods or those kind of things are a tool for it. It will just be a very slow process anyway. But in that case, it's better to have very small steps and not make decisions with higher rates. So I agree that for smaller studies, this is a sensible approach. It is a situation where, and this is a little bit what I said in one of the slides, like it's, it is possible to not have this testing thing where you criticize each other, try to refute somebody else or prove yourself wrong in these bigger conclusive studies. But that requires a lot of consensus about what you'll study and how you'll study it so that you are able to pull these studies together and coordination, right? So, so you, you have to have that in your field. And I think that is often in, in, in many fields. I don't see this either. So, I mean, if you have neither of these things, then you just end up with a bunch of small studies that have very little value, which is also a very big risk. Thanks for that, guys. Um, so I've just been having a little scroll through. I think you guys are responding quicker than me uh, to the uh, questions in the chat, which is good. Um, I just had a, um, 
a point I wanted to throw out to you about both, um, just because you've used this phrase before, um, Daniel, uh, about people committing the statistician's fallacy in terms of telling people what they should want to know or, or what they want to know. Um, obviously, the, the, the current debate is focused around a model of science framed in a hypothetical deductive philosophy. Like, is that something we need to be do doing? Is that something we want to be recommending to people? Or is there a place for a epicyclic kind of inductive deductive cycle that potentially uses the best of both worlds in this way? In this way? So I, I had the, uh, the phrase in my head after Paul's uh, initial uh, response of uh, using p-values both in a Fisherian and a kind of name and Pearson sense is we can get away with that in kinesiology because it's like having your cake and eating it and we're all really active so we can burn off the calories and, and whatnot. It's my, my poor attempt at a joke as a moderator. But so what, what, what are the thoughts around, around this, about this, um, this kind of epicyclic approach to using different approaches to, to, to statistical inference, given the phase of the scientific kind of like uh, cycle we're in? Mm -hmm. So, of course, you have um, different phases of research. Um, I think many fields actually start with qualitative research. Um, Paul mentions that a lot of uh, practitioners sometimes already know or have strong expectations that something has an effect, which in essence is sort of you're relying on qualitative insights uh, just by uh, individuals like trainers, for example. So, so that that is outside of any quantitative information or testing information. And then, yeah, collecting data, uh, these inductive approaches um, is a very, very solid starting point. Um, but so that's fine, right? So that's a good way to People should be doing this in the field. I just wonder what it leads to without this second phase where we, so how does that lead to established facts that we all build on in the future, right? And that, that is an important function, I think, of science. And, and establishing these facts, yeah, I don't really know how to do it without these procedures that sort of force us all to agree that a claim has been made with low enough error rates that we just need to take it seriously for now. Um, so this last step is also very important. So you can't just throw it out. Some people seem to want this, right? They want to throw out maybe quantitative information or this hypothetical deductive way. I'm not saying it's the only process, but it is sort of the process at which we reach this final step in the research process where we say, yeah, our field has established that this is the case. I think one of the interesting elements as well is in, in our field, uh, especially if you're, I guess, engaging in the performance side of things, uh, there's then the individual nature to consider. And so, you know, there's then the whole limitations of uh, research in terms of mean differences, et cetera, when ultimately that's going to be used uh, in some sort of um, heuristic way by a coach as a starting point, but then manipulated. So, I guess quite often there's no real, there, there is, as Daniel mentioned earlier, there's probably no truth to come to. And so, again, I don't think we need necessarily consensus. The, the whole point is trying to convince people that something that you're interested in is more likely than something else. And then ultimately a practitioner will use that as a basis and modify it there as well. So, yeah, I, I don't hold out hope for consensus. The truth. Um, I'm much more happy with, I guess, as a Bayesian, much more happy with, here's my subjective opinion. I'll try to convince you now go and use that information and see if it works in practice. Yeah. I mean, uh, I like the fact you're extremely consistent about it. So it's a very consistent viewpoint. But indeed, like I, I, I almost get shivers when you say, well, the end point should just, we are trying to convince other people and that's it. There is no truth. This is very correct. I mean, this is a logical endpoint of your approach. I, I don't want any of it. <laughs> so, so I'm going to try to, yeah, get, get people organized in your fields. Are, you are able to get consensus. It is such a great, you know, and it is difficult. You're completely right. Look at something like the International Pennant for Climate Change. Look at how much effort goes in to get consensus. It is a crazy difficult job, right? But, but then, you know, if you have it, you have real impact, right? You have it because everybody sort of has to be on board. You get real changes. So, yeah, hopefully about the most important things, because it's such an effortful process, you don't want to do this about every little, little research question. 
but there should be a couple of things where you want like the international panel for kinesiology or something. I mean, yeah, would be nice. So uh, I think a lot of this discussion, I mean, we've moved on to kind of touching on this idea of, of scientific consensus. And there's been a couple of comments around um, position stands, which are a common thing and hotly debated. So it's questionable whether they really reflect consensus other than the consensus of the 10 people on them. And oftentimes there's infighting and debate <laughs> amongst them. Um, but we, we seem to be focusing a little bit on single single studies what about this idea of kind of a cumulative approach to science and, and meta analysis um, and i have another there was a point you um obviously paul you kind of talked about uh, and daniel talked about estimation um can, can we really differentiate kind of um estimating a parameter from making a claim is estimating a parameter not making a claim about the estimate for that parameter <laughs> And, and, and so if we look at this cumulative approach to say smaller studies that may be less informative and ultimately, you know, given uh, uh, resource constraints, we might be able to justify those studies given at some point someone will do a meta-analysis in the future to better estimate whatever parameter we're interested in. Um, you know, what, 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 what is, where, where do we sit with, with this and claims and estimation <clears throat> and testing and... Paul, do you want to start? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I again. So I'll, I'll probably again, Daniel, be quite consistent. Um, I yeah, I think meta analysis is a, a, a an excellent tool to um, uh, try and generalize findings, tease out um, interesting questions. But again, I'd see you know typically would uh, analyze meta analyses through a Bayesian framework, and I'm not going to use a p value to then make a decision rule on. Um, a summary across different studies. Again, I think that uh, meta-analysis is a, a nice tool for um, coming up with a more precise estimate of a parameter. But again, that's then what, what should you believe? Um, not what should you do? I think it's what should you believe? And then it's up to the researchers who have expertise in the area to say, this is what the evidence is. Here's the costs, here's the benefits. Again, that could be done formally, formally in some sort of utility function to come to a decision. But um, you know, the, the, the frequentist perspective, which is you know, quite a simple utility uh, function just on, on the alpha, um, it's, I, I don't think that's a, a particularly good pro, um, process. I'll, I'll let Daniel come in there. Yeah. So uh, the difference between an estimate and a claim is that a claim is supposed to have a certain truth or false value, basically, right? We can accept it or we can reject it. So when you make an, when you estimate something um, and I want to prove you wrong, I should be able to do this in some way. And that's, I think, the main difference. If you say, look, um, if you just eat three tablespoons of salt every morning, that's a really great way to uh, become a better uh, soccer player, you know? And I think, really? That seems like really bad advice. And I would like to be able to prove you wrong. Then there has to be a way where we have this process where I show something and you say, look, okay, you're right. Whatever I said, whatever claim I made is wrong. With just an estimate, that's very difficult because if you say, yeah, you have a dis different estimate, what does that mean, right? So we need to have a discussion where I can say, look, you made some sort of statement here and I have falsified your claim. It's game over for your three spoons in the morning. And, and that typically requires saying not just this is my estimate, but also if you're this far away from my estimate, it's game over for me. And that aspect, that turns it into a claim, basically, because now you've not just said like this, I just described an effect. No, I've also made a claim that the effect should be in a certain range, and that's the useful range. And if it's outside of that range, it's game over for me. So that's the real difference. And you often actually see people use estimates in a way that they make a claim, which is fine. You can use a confidence interval to make claims. Then you're actually just using, and Damon Pearson also invented the confidence interval. So it's the same family of uh, actions if you want to. But this is a big difference, I think. So um, um, just making, just having estimates and just a meta analysis, for example, just in itself, you would, we would have papers that say, we, we combined a bunch of studies. This is the meta analytic estimate. Bye, good luck, do with this, whatever you want. 
But we don't end our papers like this. We say something like, and this shows that there is indeed a positive effect of, right? So we do end up with these claims. We never just say, good luck, use it for whatever you want to use it. Even though Paul is right, like if we had this huge consensus-based science, somebody would just use this estimate for some sort of utility function. Indeed, not a simple alpha utility, but a real one. Right? Like, okay, so now we know what the estimate is. Now we can compute costs and benefits. Are we going to do it or not? That is a super difficult stage to reach. Um, but the claim stage, at least, is a little bit easier. So, And just an estimate seems, yeah, nice. Thanks. What do we do with it? I'm not completely sure. <laughs> I've complete, I had a question then, I completely mind blanked. I looked at the, uh, the, the chat and it completely went, went from my mind. Ah, I know what I was going to say, say then. So uh, this might be a nice way of, of, of kind of tying things up, but it is one of the primary issues around a lot of this, the imprecision of language, um, or even the kind of the socially expected language that is used within scientific papers that may not actually be convey what we really want to convey. So for example, you know, Daniel, you've kind of tongue in cheek somewhat picked out some of Paul's papers, which have claims in the title and claims in the conclusions or the discussion. Um, but I wonder if gun to Paul's head, he would really kind of say, well, actually, it's a bit more nuanced than that. And really, this is reflective of what I believe, but it's not quite accepted to write, I believe this in my, <laughs> in my paper, unless you're writing from a more philosophical perspective, I've realized. Um, but, you know, is, is this a big issue with this? Could we could we just instead be far more nuanced and honest in what we're actually saying about the data we collect? I, yes, um, but the system that we have, um, no. Um, uh, you know, it's an interesting one as well, because if you think there's certain journals where there's the final section is a practical application, application section where you are forced to state what your recommendation is. Uh, and in most papers, um, uh, depending on the journal, again, a reviewer will force what the so what question. So you've, this is, these are your results. You've nicely summarized them, but what is the recommendation? So yeah, part of that is the system that we're in. Um, but yeah, I think um, um, a more I think probably Daniel would agree with this and um, splitting research into more exploratory, maybe there's what should I believe and then building towards more confirmatory and then in there being quite explicit with, we followed this process, we can, you know, it was pre-registered, um, we put all these safeguards into ensuring that our error rates are somewhat realistic to what we believe, this is quite conclusive. Um, my thoughts are that 99 plus percent would be exploratory and less than 1% would be confirmatory, but I, I don't actually don't see anything wrong with that, to be honest. Yeah, I, I largely agree with that. I think there is some role for the claims, but I'll get to that. But first, I think I agree with Paul that it would be a big improvement um, if we distinguish sort of the, the, the thing we're doing. And some fields do this, so you might know this the term like a phase three clinical trial or even a phase four clinical trial exists, but the phase three is the one where we do the big tests where we're really like, okay, we understand what we're doing here. This is the big test. Is this the thing we're going to use now? Yes or no. Um, and there are phase one and phase two trials. And I agree with, well, maybe 90, 99% of what we do is actually somewhere in the phase one or the phase two trials. Again, the, the, the paper today with this um, ego depletion study where everybody gets together and they work on a huge study and that's the phase three test, right? We do them sometimes, but most of the time we are in these first uh, levels. About the titles and the claims, making claims in titles is a thing that is a limitation in our system, I think. But it is the way that we work now. So many people produce so many papers, right? If we had a consensus system and everybody worked on the same big questions, we wouldn't need to shout and get attention for our work or get people to test whether our claims are actually correct or not. We would just make sure that this is very well done in large collaborative uh, research projects. We don't have this. So the way you want me, you know, to get me to read your paper is to publish a paper with the title P-values are better than, or base factors are better than P-values. 
And then I'm like, no way, no way, no way. I have to read this paper. This can't be right. And I'm going to show it, damn it. Um, or you translate it to whatever your field is, right? You have a field of study and people say, yeah, our thing works better than your thing. And we keep sort of debating each other like this. That's how we draw attention. I'm not saying it's good, but there's, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a correlation between uh, impact factor of the field and how often they uh, tell people to make these kind of claims in their titles. It draws attention. It gets people worked up. And in a distributed system where we don't coordinate our actions, that is how we respond to each other and try to refute each other. You know, It's a sort of sad state of affairs, but I think that's why we do it sociology-wise, right? I'm not saying it's good, but that's why we do it, I think. So it's not an ideal system, but that seems to be how it works now. I was going to say, given how uh, critical you've been of Kuhn, Daniel, there does seem to be a lot of sociology creeping into the uh, discussion. It's like, well, we'd ideally do it like this, but this is how it works. Are we kind of falling into a description, uh, <laughs> prescription kind of dichotomy there? Um, Okay, so I, I we, we've come up to five o'clock. Um, I mean, I appreciate other people will have maybe scheduled in an hour to sit and listen to the debate. Um, if we've got anything else we want to burning to discuss, or if there's any, if anyone's got any burning questions they would like to ask, I think um, we discussed ahead of this that we can probably uh, add another sort of ten to fifteen minutes onto this if we need to. So if if there's anyone who's got a question, I think the raise hand function should be working. If you want to actually kind of ask your question, we'll use the last sort of 10-15 um, minutes to have um, questions from the audience. Um, if, you, if you don't want to actually be uh, recorded on audio though, feel free to raise your hand um, and then um, you, can, you can type your question into the chat. This could be really successful or everyone's eager to go. <laughs> actually, I'll, I'll kind of scroll through the list of people here because I think if people put up their hands, there's too many people to see on camera. I'm not sure if it'll be oh, here. Good point. Good point. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Oh, wow. This is probably one of the best attended sessions we've had. Just scrolling through the list of people. I think so. What did like five people turn up to my last session? <laughs> so it's obviously but not this, me drawing the crowd. <laughs> this is what you get if you have uh, strong claims on either side. Everybody wants to know who's right and wrong. And this is exactly why we make those claims based on these key values. Just gets people's attention. Like fate seminars. Um, oh, I can see. I think there's a hand up. Whose hand is it? I can't tell. Gr Grand Ept, I see. Oh, Grand Hello. Hello. Go on, Hello. Grand. There we, ah, there we go. Good stuff. I might be on a different page. <laughs> Um, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, really interesting. Um, many of us on here are academics, teach undergraduate students. Um, I guess the inevitable question for us is, how do we, how do we get this nuance and subtlety across to our students in a way that is logical and not confusing? Um, because the vast majority of studies that they read as part of their studies will be frequentist statistics, less so Bayesian at the current time. So many would argue, you know, that we have to focus on what they will be reading and how can they understand the statistics and the data oh, in, in these papers. Um, but of course, um, we also have to co cover, as you two have done today, the criticisms of different approaches to statistical analysis and do that all within one class of 12 weeks across a, a three-year degree. And um, your psychology is slightly different, I think, from our field, where there's a lot greater focus on statistical analysis and I think our discipline is quite poor at um, teaching our students but it's maybe not the, the teaching of it but just the focus because we're a very applied discipline and most students want to be outside running about doing things um, so just interested in your opinions really on data analysis statistics education at the undergraduate level and how we as educators, how we navigate our students through this maze. Yeah, I think this is a super important 
question, right? Because I'm all about, uh, it's fun to debate these kind of things, but then we go back and then what do we do, right? Um, for some reason, people spend a lot more words on what's wrong with p-values than on studies examining how we can actually teach people to use them in the best possible way. Um, so I'm completely with you that I think this is an important thing to do. A couple of things that I think help, um, there is a little bit of evidence that um, teaching people equivalence testing, so not just how to reject the null hypothesis, but also the opposite to say, okay, the effect is too small to matter, prevents some of these misconceptions about, um, yeah, that uh, Paul actually mentioned. Um, and, I, and it's just a t-test anyway. So I think making that sort of part of the curriculum early on is good. I would also force people to write up what it actually means, like Neyman and Pearson say in their proposal, they say, without ever knowing whether angle, a, a, any single study is true or false, we can act like, you know? I mean, if, if you would force people to write that literally down, that would already make this certainty thing a little bit more uh, wobbly, I would say. So, um, but there's not a lot of research on there. People have done a couple of studies, but there's not a lot on how to uh, teach them very well. Um, I actively teach them all the misinterpretations in any case. I mean, uh, um, try to explain why they are misunderstanding. So not just teach them what the correct way to do it is, but also all the intuitive ways they will get it wrong. So put those in education helps. Beyond that, I don't know. These are my three uh, things that I do. And uh, we need more research on how to improve it and less papers, again, saying why p-values are so horrible. <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is, as you mentioned, uh, incredibly hard problem. Um, for me, I think one of the, the, the major elements is, you know, yeah, you've, you've typically got that, as you said, that research methods block <clears throat> where you're, uh, you know, where you're, where you're teaching uh, inferential statistics. I, I think a lot of the work comes earlier in data analysis and showing, you know, flexibility, creative creativity, um, insight, um, and a lot can be done ahead of time. Um, and then, yeah, you've got that balance of obviously covering what the different statistical tests are, what they mean, um, but if individuals are, are, are taught almost two trains, this is what we do. However, this is potentially how you should think and how we should develop in the future. Um, getting away from an algorithmic perspective is your data you know, uh, normally distributed, ordinal interval ratio, do you have this, then do a t-test, then do, you know, Friedman, et cetera. I, I think that's where the problems lie because effectively we're reinforcing certainty. There's only one way to do things. And yeah, I think the biggest improvement we can make for students is getting out of that perspective and sort of teaching that um, analysis is creative uh, and there's lots of different ways of doing it. Everything has strengths and weaknesses. And I also think that will help students go on to become better practitioners. But I think you're right. There's then that dialectic, um, you know, with then um, actually when they go and actually read research, it is of a certain way and everything is hypothesis testing and so on. So yeah, I think it's a, 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 hard, a hard challenge. Just a very quick follow-up. Given that most of our students will not go on to be researchers, won't become academics, Yes, they have to do an undergraduate dissertation, at least in, in the UK. Um, that might be the only time they actually do research. But when they go out to be a practitioner, um, they will have to consume, well, hopefully, if we've taught them well about evidence-based practice, they'll, they'll want to consume and interpret other people's uh, evidence and should we be spending more time on, on teaching them how to interpret data and, and maybe how to be more skeptical about those claims that you mentioned, Daniel? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good idea. So some uh, examples of how biased literature is. I mean, it might drive more people away from <laughs> a career in science, but yeah, uh, illustrating that there are some issues and also um, how they can evaluate whether a test it actually is a good test or not, right? So um, uh, again, that's one of the functions pre-registration allows you to do. You can take a look at, okay, this seems to be a pretty good test they're doing, or this is just one of 28 things um, that they try to do. And um, 
so that helps, I think, teaching them a little bit about bias, also publication bias, um, saying that a single study is no study, again, which is also what Fisher and Neyman originally wrote in their own papers, right? A single demonstration is not enough. It is frequent statistics. You want to be able to show it a couple of times. Now, especially in a biased literature, so, yeah. I guess for me, the advice would be ignore p-values. Look at the actual data come to what do you think it means uh, does this then map up so yeah I, I think, oh, come on ball come on come on we were I mean, so close we were so close it was going so well <laughs> was. Um, yeah the, the p-value i guess it's a very lazy way the p-value is this so you know look look at the actual data that are confidence intervals undersized understanding the effect sizes across the different variables are they standardized are they not does that mean this one's more important yeah, the skill is in looking at everything but the p-value. The p-value just funnels everything down into a yes, no, whereas I, yeah, I spend a lot of time um, putting tables up, graphs up, different kinds. What do you think the results show? Then finally, does this agree with the p-value? If not, should you be skeptical, et cetera? We were, we were close, Daniel. Yeah. Hey, Mayor, I saw you had your hand up a moment ago. And then Paul actually started answering the question. I'm not even sure what my own question is, but I suppose listening to you both and listening to multiple sessions that we've had here, we have all these things. We have generalizability crises and replication crises. It just always seems to come down to a crisis of overinterpretation. Is a simple solution if we just collectively down regulated our expectation of what any one study means as reviewers, as writers, as editors, because I can think anyone would agree, both of you are right and <laughs> there are a place and a situation for all of these things is this is our main problem that we're just trying to do something that's just not possible i.e take seven people give them a supplement <laughs> test them again and then decide if the supplement works or not whatever works means in a performance point of view do we just need to collectively down regulate download down our expectation and just agree that everything is smaller uh, than, than we kind of need and then yeah mm. I don't even know why I'm trying to say that. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I mean, it's it's the recognition that getting um, robust, reliable insights about something is extremely difficult because so far we've just talked about establishing maybe a single claim, but then um, you also have to rule out another uh, alternative explanations for the same effect, right? A claim is just this effect is happening, but we also want to know why. So then we have to test a lot of auxiliary uh, assumptions. We need to see, does this actually generalize beyond the small group? You know, so much research goes into making not just a tiny claim, but having a solid knowledge base. Um, so yeah, and again, this phase one, phase two, phase three uh, language, uh, which is common in other fields might also help a little bit, yeah. Yeah, I agreed. And I think that's where journals having quite clear guidelines and stating where your research falls in that sort of spectrum would, would be really helpful. And so most individuals being happy just to say the results are exploratory, um, et cetera, I think would, would, would potentially solve, uh, solve a lot of that problems. We, we've discussed this as well, I think, uh, in previous uh, sessions, but given the state of our field there is probably a large space for um i'm going to pimp one of your papers then daniel with um colleagues that are, we, we, we may not be quite ready for the hypothesis testing that has been debated today and actually deeper thought into what even are the concepts we're interested in exploring what are good operationalizations of them are they valid and necessary and sufficient conditions for those concepts and all of these different things that go into rich theory building to get to the stage that we can we can use the, any hypothesis test well um it's probably something that our field should be considering a lot more um i, I can't see any more hands up um and we're just coming up to court past the hour so um gents do you want to uh make any final points before we kind of wrap up and uh let everyone go off their respective things i've got dinner with the in-laws so <laughs> i need to head beyond off. that i was that i was right i won i won paul i won i mean come on <laughs> we were going to flip yeah. a coin and then we were going to do yeah. this debate next week and then the week after and the week after and just keep doing it and uh, maybe more seriously that I, I think it's good to talk about these things because you see that you very quickly move on from a p-value to like the real underlying issues, right? So I think often the statistics is actually just an, uh, 
uh, output of the real underlying issues that we try to address, which are limitations in what we can know and those kind of things. So, so it's good to get that clear. Yeah. Um, did I maybe snuck a win? Maybe, maybe I never. But uh, no, I, I enjoyed it a lot. So um, thanks, uh, Daniel. Uh, thanks, James and uh, Emer for organising. It was good fun. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks again yeah, for organising, Emer, and and thanks both. Uh, to Daniel and uh, Paul for today's, today's debate, and thanks for everyone for their sort of engagement in the in the chat. I, I tried to sort of in, interpret and, and paraphrase some of the questions in there, so apologies if I've not kind of captured everything that's been discussed. Um, the session's been recorded, so people can watch it back if there's anything they've they've missed or want to pick up on. Um, and uh, both Paul and Daniel are on Twitter as well now. Um, Paul's recently joined, so. Um, if you've got any questions, head over there and uh, spam them with tweets. Okay, thanks so much. Cool. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks, everyone. Got to stop Thank recording you. here now. Thank you.